Andreas, you're muted. I'm sorry. So again, I'm trying to say the welcome to this webinar that we have on behalf of the uh, SSAT PG and CME committee. Um, I think we have a very interesting topic that may affect many of us who operate throughout the abdomen. Um, we see patients that have had previous operations, their anatomy is totally changed, and maybe we do not come in as the respective specialist who now all of a sudden has to deal with a, with a situation and anatomy that we may not be totally familiar with or that uh, does not allow us the typical strategy of uh, working up such a patient. And um, from that standpoint, I think it is a very important topic. Um, the um, webinar will contain five uh, talks from different um, um, specialists. Um, we'll have a 15-minute um, Q&A session at the end of this, uh, this webinar. Um, I'd like to also point out that the materials that we present here will ultimately be available in the SSAT uh, website uh, through um, a podcast uh, format where it can be also accessed later on. So um, let me pass the further introduction to Dr. Sukandi. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Andres. And, um, <clears throat> My name is Iswanto Sukhani. I'm an HPV surgeon at Advent Health in Tampa. And uh, thank you for all coming. I uh, started to see um, uh, more and more people uh, joining us. And I've seen uh, several familiar names from uh, prior work in Pittsburgh and all that. Um, like Andrew said, we have uh, five uh, talks. Um, I think uh, without further ado, we're gonna start with the first talk because we have uh, quite a bit of uh, content here. The first talk will be delivered by uh, Dr. Matthew Hutter from uh, Mass General. Uh, he is a full professor of surgery. Uh, he's a general uh, GI laparoscopic and bariatric surgeon. He will be sharing with us uh, acute complication of ulcer disease in the gastric bypass patient. Uh, please, Matthew. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present, and I very much look forward to this discussion in the webinar tonight. Is it showing up okay on the screen right now? All right, excellent. So the session tonight, challenges after anatomy altering surgery, and I'll be talking about acute complications of ulcer disease in the gastric bypass patient. Again, my name is Matt Hutter from the Mass General Hospital. These are my disclosures, um, none of which are relevant for today. So first thing about challenges with the anatomy altering surgery is knowing the anatomy. And so first and foremost, I wanna talk a little bit about the Roux and Y gastric bypass, the anatomy that we'll be talking about today. So the Roux and Y gastric bypass made up of a, a gastric pouch, um, an egg sized pouch, which is usually separated from the gastric remnant or excluded stomach. Now, be careful of the terms here. I like to use the word excluded stomach instead of gastric remnant. And that's because uh, earlier on in my career, we asked interventional radiology to put a, uh, a, a G tube into the gastric remnant. And of course, they thought that was the stomach that was left behind and they put it into the pouch. Uh, so from now on, I always call it the excluded stomach. So there's no, no, no uh, challenges there. But you can see that the, uh, the Roux limb can pass anti-colic, anti-gastric, the biliopancreatic limb, the common channel. But knowing the anatomy, I think, is really going to be key. And it's blood supply, as will be talked about by other people um, with regards to the presentations today. So here in Roux and Y gastric bypass, initially most of them were done retrocolic, retrogastric. In fact, a dinosaur like me, I actually still do my laparoscopic procedures retrocolic, retrogastric. But most people are doing an anti-colic, anti-gastric limb, and knowing where that limb is is important. If you need to pull up a G tube or things like that, or get access to that um, excluded stomach, not gastric remnant, excluded stomach, then um, then you want to know where that Roux limb is, and that can change what you do. So retrocolic, retrogastric, as you can see behind the colon, behind the stomach, anti-colic, anti-gastric, above and above, and then combinations therein. So retrocolic, anti-gastric, or anti-colic, retrogastric are also done. And you should really kind of, if you have the op note, look for it. And if not, have your mind open about where that Roux limb might be. Other things to consider. Um, nowadays, we don't see as many open gastric bypasses, but there are many of them lurking out there. 
open gastric bypasses are much more likely to develop a gastrogastric fistula. So you can see in the laparoscopic gastric bypass that it's divided. So the pouch is divided from the excluded stomach. Whereas traditionally a lot of the open gastric bypasses were used with the TA90B stapler. They were stapled, but non-divided. And then there's a much higher uh, a problem with regards to gastrogastric fistulas that we'll talk about a little bit later on. And also gastrogastric fistulas are associated with anastomotic ulcers, which is part of the talk here today. So when you think about bariatric surgery complications, I was asked to talk about acute complications, specifically anastomotic ulcers. But when you think about the complications, there are early complications like leak, bleeds, gastric remnant or excluded stomach dilatation, pulmonary embolism, post-hospital nausea, vomiting, things like that. And that's separate from the late complications like marginal ulcers, stomal stenosis, bowel obstructions, and fistula. And today I'll really be focusing on this, the, the marginal ulcers, but I'll also talk a little bit about the bowel obstruction um, and the internal hernias, because I think when you think about anatomy altering surgery, you really need to think about those aspects as well. So anastomotic or otherwise known as marginal ulcers, they're at the gastrojejunostomy. They're not really seen at the jejunojejunostomy. I suppose they can happen, but it's clinically not relevant. And we'll talk about why. And that's because it's re really mucosal ulceration um, due on, at the GG, uh, as, GJ anastomosis. And it's usually seen on the jejunal side. So be careful if people are doing scopes. Sometimes they look in, they're, they're looking around at the pouch and they don't see any ulcer. You need to go just past the anastomosis and look in the small bowel side in order to see a lot of these anastomosis. So um, high index of suspicion. And if someone's doing an endoscopy for this, make sure you look across the anastomosis, especially if there is a, a uh, stomal stenosis at that area. The cause is multifactorial. Um, as is the mucosal defenses of the GI tract. So there's ischemia, acid, mucosal integrity. They all play a role with regards to anastomotic ulcers and are part of the etiology. Because of that, things like NSAIDs um, are a big, uh, a big cause of the gastrojejunal anastomosis and taking a history of, of NSAIDs is very important. Smoking is one of the biggest things with regards to creating these ulcers. And actually nowadays for a lot of us, if people are have smoke are, are smokers and have been for a long time and smoke just for, and quit smoking just for the operation, I generally don't offer them a ruin why gastric bypass because that risk of an ulceration is is real. Acid plays a role, and so if you leave a large pouch, then you can leave some of the acid producing cells left behind. And if there's a gastrogastric fistula, like I talked about before, which is again more common in the open, um, undivided gastric bypass, then you can have acid. Foreign body, um, so permanent sutures actually can be a nidus for part of these ulcers. And uh, historically, I know I initially was using permanent sutures and most of us have changed since then to absorbable sutures to avoid this after a lot of the endoscopists were, were picking out these, these sutures from, uh, from our, our anastomoses. And H. pylori, of course, can play a role as well. Patients presenting with pain, bleeding, and perforation, and, um, and something that needs to be considered in abdominal pain in a patient who has had this. So I'll present a couple of cases. Uh, case number one here for an asthmatic ulcer is a 36-year-old woman. She's one and a half years status post a laparoscopic wound y gastric bypass. And she's presenting with burning epigastric pain, no nausea or vomiting. Food makes it feel a bit better. And um, so a careful history here makes a high index of suspicion of what's going on here. More careful history would be, of course, about smoking or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications as an etiology. Endoscopy done here, you can see the, the, uh, the ulcer, which is on the small bowel side across the anastomosis, fat really shallow, fairly shallow ulcer here. And this patient can be treated with uh, uh, proton pump inhibitors. We generally give BID proton pump inhibitors for the situation. Some people talk about opening up the capsule for, for further absorption. I'm not sure it makes a difference, but some people swear by that. And caraphate as a suspension um, is also a treatment as well. You can't take them at the same time. They kind of knock each other out. So they have to be taken um, at least an hour apart if they, they're, they're taking that whole regimen. And the suspension is more important because if they just take caraphate pills, then they're gonna um, um, dissolve past the anastomosis. And this, this patient, six weeks later, she gets scoped again. It's mostly healed. She has no further symptoms. And her, her trick was to avoid NSAIDs going forward. So acid and ischemia playing a role in these situations. Smoking and NSAIDs are the, the warning flags to look out for here and the potential reversible causes that you can address. Case number two, 
46 year old man, had an open gastric bypass. Four years later, he underwent a gastric digital, uh, revision for ulcers because he had a gastrogastric fistula from that open gastric bypass. One year later, he presents with epigastric pain and bleeding, bleeding from an anastomotic ulcer, went down, was down in Cape Cod, um, not too far from us, down by, the, down by the beach. The endoscopist looked in there, saw this, thought he saw a visible vessel, so just backed off, sent him up to us. And then um, in, in there, they found some retained suture, which is a nidus, had a gastrogastric fistula, which is extra acid, like I talked about before, in this horrible looking area, which was then injected with epinephrine to stop the bleeding, at which point he exsanguinated. Literal exsanguination read out in the endoscopy suite. Um, I was, I've been a trauma surgeon for 10 years at that time, and I did an emergent exploratory laparotomy, aortic cross clamp, oversewing of the ulcer, splenic artery, transfused 26 units of blood cells and in, in appropriate platelets and things like that. And he had a big gastrogastric fistula that I just opened up the stomach, put my finger on there. After cross clamping the aorta, oversewed his splenic artery, then later on took him to, uh, endo, uh, to uh, IR in order to do a splenic artery embolization. And uh, greatest guy, he, he sends me a Christmas card every year, but all ulcers are not the same. Um, so yeah, that's, this is just kind of a warning sign in thinking about the, anastomo, about the anatomy here. Here, it's a gastrogastric fistula. Here, it's a different approach and a different problem. When you think about that anastomosis, the gastrojejunal anastomosis, right on its posterior wall is a splenic artery in the splenic vein. So if you erode posteriorly, bingo. And that's the red out that we're talking about here. Things to think about anatomically. Here's a picture of a gastrogastric fistula. Again, that's usually between an, an open uh, and, and the, the connection between the, the old stomach and the new stomach, the remnant and the excluded stomach um, um, can be seen here. Gastrogastric fistula, again, can be hard to see sometimes endoscopically. You need a high level of suspicion in order to do that, um, as opposed to the gastrojejunal anastomosis. I think it would also important in talking about anatomy alterating and ruin my gastric bypass about different obstructions. Sure, it can be adhesions, food bezoars, internal hernias, trochar site hernias, or intussusceptions. I wanna specifically talk about uh, internal hernias because that's something that we need to think about anatomically. So there are three different mesenteric traps um, that can be there, potentially three. If it's retrocolic and retrogastric, then, then, uh, um, then you can have the third one, which is through the transverse mesocolon. So number one is the Peterson's defect. Anytime you take a rule in, you cut that mesentery, and that can lead to a, a Peterson's type defect, and that needs to be addressed. So that's over here is number one. Jejunojejunostomy is the other part of that, uh, of the cut mesentery, and that needs to be closed as well. And, um, and the third is the transverse, meson uh, transverse uh, mesocolon mesentery, and the bowel can pass up through there. So closing those with uh, permanent sutures is important, but even if they're closed, they can open up again and can be a problem. Not all surgeons close them. And then the anticholic, anti-gastric, Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, that's a big space. And a lot of people don't feel the need to close that or they close that partially. Um, so maybe internal hernias are less likely, but if it happens, it's a lot of bowel that gets stuck in, up in there and that can be a big problem. So thinking anatomically about the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, think about these traps. Um, here's uh, here's a, a, a rule limb, uh, a, a piece of bowel coming through the uh, Peterson's defect. And the key on these, if you're ever in one of these cases, is start distally. Go to the ileocecal valve, the bowels decompress, follow up that, that decompressed bowel, and then you can come up proximally and things become a lot more clear when you start distally from the decompressed bowel. Of course, you want to go to that big purple, you know, ischemic mass and, and try to wrestle with that and undo it and not pop it. Uh, but you're better starting distally. And that's really an, a tip there that you should think about with regards to these mesenteric traps. When you reduce them, close them um, so that they don't happen again, of course. And intussusception. Intussusception common in the, in the, um, in the jejunojejunostomy. It looks like this target sign here where a piece of bowel is, is, is completely um, goes within the other piece of bowel from that standpoint. It can be a, a rather benign finding on a CT scan that's asymptomatic or it can be an emergency. And so you need to sort that part out. And, um, and then with regards to the anatomically what to do here, sometimes you can just decompress them. You can kind of milk them out and then consider pexing them. Sometimes they need to be resected because they're dead and uh, they won't be removed. Um, so reconstructing a, a jejunojejunostomy is somewhat challenging and it usually takes two anastomoses to do it right. Um, and, you, and, and that's something to consider. 
So again, the key to understanding complications is understanding the anatomy and the Ruin Y gastric bypass, know the anatomy, know where the limbs are and, uh, and know how to fix them. And that's my brief talk and I look forward to the other ones. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Wow, that's that's uh, that's excellent talk, Matt. And um, I feel like that's very uh, practical. And I hope a lot of uh, people can um, bring a take home message for uh, for their own practice. Um, thank you, Matt. Really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna move on to the second talk. Uh, it's gonna be uh, delivered by uh, my co moderator, uh, Dr. Andres Kaiser. He's a professor in chief of uh, colorectal surgery from City of Hope. Uh, Andres is going to be uh, talking about management of uh, bowel pathology in the post cystectomy patient. All for you, um, Andres. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, again, I'm, I'm a colorectal surgeon. I work mostly in the abdomen and I have um, not at last through my collaboration with our urologists, a lot of exposure to patients who have really um, a changed anatomy. These are my disclosures. Um, none of them are relevant for this topic. So patients um, that have had urology procedures may have had different types of urology procedures, such as prostatectomy or urethral implantation. Those are not really relevant um, very often. Um, nephrectomy, bladder augmentation, but a significant uh, uh, part of patients have had cystectomies for bladder cancer. Now, the way that they reconstruct them is either they put a new bladder in and reconstruct a new bladder create a continent cutaneous reservoir or just have a urinary conduit. <clears throat> the conditions why those um, procedures were necessary and also the um, conditions that we might potentially come across in such patients could be tumor, there could be the GI tumors or a urological tumor, it could be a primary tumor or a recurrent tumor, and it's always a question whether it's a curable situation versus a palliative situation. There could be non-tumorous uh, conditions such as a leak, a perforation. Um, it could originate from the bowel or um, originate from the urinary system. There are all kinds of inflammatory or fistulizing diseases when we talk about the GI tract and obviously diverticulitis, IBD, radiation, uh, complications from the previous surgery, or again, a tumor that may have formed. Um, there may be bowel obstructions, and sure enough, there may be issues with the existing stoma that it prolapses, herniates, uh, retracts, or strictures, and so forth. So these are sort of a, just to give you a little bit of an overview, what we might come across. So when we do have to do bowel surgery in such patients, then again, there are different stages that we um, have to uh, plan for, and one is first getting in and whatever uh, method you use and perform a dissection of the tissue, uh, define the anatomy, understand the anatomy, ultimately identify the target pathology, whether it's the tumor, the leak, or the fistula, et cetera, and then figure out how to properly address that problem, either by resection or by fixing or repairing it, or by maybe restoring or rerouting the anatomy. Just to, again, give you a quick overview of um, the aspects that we need to consider. First of all, the anatomy as such, then very important is where is the blood supply currently and where would the blood supply be when you have finished your procedure? <clears throat> In terms of reconstruction, what can be used? What uh, is there sufficient length? What is needed to mobilize it to adequately reach? What do we leave behind? And do we need a um, plan for a storm in that uh, situation? So just for those who are not so familiar with how actually those urinary um, parts are constructed, here we have an image from um, C.A. Dynishman's book about uh, uh, urinary diversion. 
So an orthotopic bladder is typically created with a segment of small bowel, whereby a um, uh, area is taken out in the center and a, a bladder is formed um, and the small bowel is then reconnected either you know, typically with the mesentery before integrate to the mesentery that uh, feeds the bladder. <clears throat> if we have a, um, for example, here a, a 51 year old patient with a history of prostate cancer uh, many years ago who then developed severe long term radiation damage um, that required uh, hyperbaric oxygen, it would be the Bleeding episodes, he was diverted and reversed because they thought it would re um, recover. And ultimately, he had pneumaturia that uh, formed and required essentially a pelvic accentuation, whereby we did a, um, um, a uh, new bladder here. And you see that in the image here. So, this is the bladder, and behind it is the reconstructed rectum. Obviously, the bladder doesn't look normal compared to a normal bladder, but it looks actually pretty reasonable. So that is what um, an orthotopic bladder looks like. And when we, um, can, when the urologist cannot do an orthotopic reconstruction, then they may consider a uh, content cutaneous urinary reservoir, also referred to as an Indiana pouch. For that, they take the right colon and then connect the terminal ileum to the proximal um, transverse colon. And it's always a bite, uh, sorry, a fight in the OR where we sort of have to negotiate how much of the blood vessels they can receive and where it stops and so forth. Um, what we really want to make sure is that they leave the mid colic artery that the entire left-sided colon um, is totally um, secured in terms of blood supply, even if the IMA was taken at a later time. What it looks like is this way, and you see, obviously, this patient has had a big um, laparotomy. This is the continent cutaneous reservoir. So the patient, uh, sorry, the stoma for that continent cutaneous reservoir, um, oftentimes the, that stoma is at the umbilicus. So just be aware of such patients when you re-enter that if you do a laparotomy and there is a, a catheterizable stoma at the belly button, uh, be careful not to get into the integrity of that structure. So let me present also a few cases and obviously um, also the previous speaker relied on cases. I think it's very difficult to find thousands of cases that we can just present studies, etc. But it's the casuistic here that um, can illustrate a little bit where the problems sit. So here we have a 65-year-old patient, um, a male patient, had a history of uh, early bladder cancer, had a status post cystoprostatectomy with um, having the neobladder in place. Again, it's very difficult to actually analyze the urine from such patients because it certainly doesn't look normal even under the healthy circumstances. But he truly had recurrent UTIs. What should we do now? So obviously there needs to be a workup. He had a CT scan that showed some air in the neobladder and the differential diagnosis obviously then includes some things connecting with that bladder. Is it uh, um, the large intestine such as uh, endiverticulitis for example, or is it maybe the small intestine? And the reality obviously was that um, here we have an anastomosis in close proximity to um, the new bladder. And if that's leaking, it can certainly find its way into um, the neobladder and fistulize. And that's what happened uh, with this uh, patient. Now, the way to approach this is to perform an exploration and ultimately to most likely perform a small bowel resection of that leaky area. Um, but it is very, very important to make sure that the blood supply to the underlying Ileal neobladder is not injured. So, whatever I'm talking here about uh, in, the, in all cases that we do uh, discuss, preserving the blood supply to respective areas of critical importance. So, <clears throat> this is what we need to do. Sometimes um, we can 
just over so um, or resect that pla that segment. Sometimes it's too close to the TI, to the ileocecal valve that we might have to actually perform an iliocolonic anastomosis. But the bottom line is the blood supply uh, to the neobladder needs to be preserved. Here I have a second case, 36 year old female with a history of radiation. And again, that's a, a common topic, previous radiation brachytherapy with respective complications. So there was no active cancer but the patient developed bilateral hydronephrosis um, and essentially a cloaca in her uh, pelvis, everything started to communicate uh, with each other such that she required a um, uh, resection. Um, here we have So she had an initial um, anterior resection and at some point everything started to um, communicate down there. We see a drain in here. And the question is, what should we do? So she has this kind of anatomy. Here the right colon was, had, had been taken for the urinary conduit. This is present. Um, there is something leaking in the rectum um, otherwise, it wouldn't communicate also with that uh, pelvic cavity. <clears throat> so concerns that we have is, A, it's acutely inflamed. Everything is probably very poor quality. Um, patient had been radiated before, so that adds to the poor quality of the tissues. We don't 100% know uh, the cause of the breakdown. Could it be that it is just radiation or post-surgical trauma, or is there cancer uh, even still there. What can we preserve? Is it, can that uh, uh, bladder pouch be reserved? Does it has to be resected and converted to an, a urinary conduit or can it be refashioned or fixed or so? Um, and again, what needs to be done for the rectal part? So do we need to resect the rectum? And if so, comes the um, critical uh, question, where is that blood supply coming from? So if I have the rectum and I need to do a typical um, resection where I might go after the um, IMA pedicle, I might not have anything left uh, behind to feed that part if that mid colic artery had been compromised. So very important that we verify before we resect anything that there is an adequate blood supply coming from the mid colic. So that's what we then uh, need to do. We do a stepwise approach, or we did a stepwise approach first, just to perform a um, laparoscopic creation of a transverse loop colostomy far away, making sure not to compromise the, uh, the um, marginal artery, um, such that um, the blood supply would not be compromised now or later at any time. After a wait period of six months, we uh, allowed the, which, which allowed the patient to be reconditioned. We went back in and performed the actual reconstruction, which was an LAR with a colanal anastomosis, vaginectomy, et cetera, and a repair of the Indiana pouch. And again, after a uh, wait period of uh, a couple of months, we then uh, performed the restoration with the colostomy takedown, whereby I have to uh, quickly mention that uh, for the stage two part, we didn't do a straight anastomosis, but we did a, a staged anastomosis in terminal cote technique where, oops, where the uh, rectum was initially protuberant. It was uh, um, left as such that it could sort of heal into the uh, pelvic floor. And after a period of waiting, it was then resected such that it had, even if it had retracted, it would have not uh, created again a rectovaginal fistula. So that was done in that patient um, and um, ultimately allowed to preserve both the urinary integrity and uh, um, colorectal integrity. Here we have a, another case similar in, in, in nature, uh, a little bit older patient uh, than the previous one, so 70 years old. Again, a GYN pathology, had pelvic radiation and, and respective surgeries. She developed massive radiation cystitis that resulted in, in um, severe hematuria. And she essentially underwent um, an urgent cystectomy with continent cutaneous reservoir. Since that surgery, she had 
perfect uh, urinary function, but intermittent pelvic infections. She had several CT scans that um, required um, some interventions <clears throat> um, where she had in the pelvis some uh, fluid collections and she had a drain placed. Here is the neobladder and here are these infectious uh, pockets. So whenever the drain was removed, um, the infection would start again. So what should we do with this patient? A little bit similar to what we did before. <clears throat> we have uh, concern about the inflammation. We have concern about uh, preserving the intestinal continuity at some point, And we wonder where is the blood supply coming before and after. So similar to the case I discussed before, um, we had to do certain things uh, to precondition the patient, whereby she did not require uh, any urinary intervention because obviously that part had worked well. So in essence, we did first a laparoscopic uh, colostomy, let it cool off, and again went back um, for the um, low interior section with colon anastomosis, this time just a straightforward uh, colon anastomosis. Um, the whole pathology was most likely related to diverticulitis um, unless there was from the first surgery some intraoperative uh, injury to the colon, but that's hard to distinguish at that stage. And further case is a um, 54 year old, sorry, 52 year old uh, patient with a history of complications after previous multimodality treatment for rectal cancer. She had six months um, later after that uh, surgery drainage of stool per vagina, a uh, diverting colostomy was sec or an end colostomy was sec created, whereby it's um, totally unclear from the previous records where the blood supply to the reconstructed rectum was actually coming from. So it could be that they left some non-perfused uh, bowel in the pelvis. <clears throat> she had over time then concern of an enlarging pelvic mass, developed bilateral hydronephrosis and ultimately required a uh, um, exploration with removal of debris, et cetera. Um, because the kidneys became an increasing problem with hydronephrosis, she had um, a bladder augmentation in chimney fashion formed. And again, what that is, is a bladder, sorry, a small bowel segment is augmented onto the top of the bladder and the ureters, which are too short to reach um, by a conventional reconstruction, are then fed into that, um, into that uh, segment. So you see here the bladder, you see here the conduit further up, and the ureters that feed into the um, bladder augmentation. So, You see here the ureters. So in this patient, again, we have considerations and concerns. Um, what is the cause of the inflammation? Is this ischemic or um, ischemia of that reconstruction that they left in? Is it recurrent cancer? Um, is there any chance to um, preserve or restore intestinal continuity? And what happens to that space where that um, debris was in if we don't fill it with any um, specific organ? And certainly enough for even accessing that area, that bladder chimney is totally in the way. So during the surgical exploration that was um, then necessary, <clears throat> uh, it was, would be necessary to separate the bladder chimney from the um, bladder dome in order to even get access and ultimately perform a redo LAR, take the colostomy down and swing it into that space that the space has some tissue because otherwise it will just <clears throat> suck in some small bowel loops and continue to smolder without uh, ever having a chance to uh, cool off. And last but not least, here we have a, a patient with uh, who is 50 years old at uh, the history of multimodality treatment again for rectal cancer and he developed a rectal urinary fistula um, that uh, was related to the radiation 
and also resulted in stricturing of both ureters. So again, bad situation, bad tissues, the recommendation or the plan was ultimately to perform a pelvic accentuation. Now the question is, how can um, that um, uh, area be reconstructed? Is the pelvic floor as such intact or the sphincters intact? And the answer was a yes. Um, could the intestine theoretically be reconstructed? And the answer is yes. Um, and the question is, what form of urinary reconstruction would be doable? So again, from our standpoint, the reconstruction was, uh, was possible. However, um, because the patient had um, also a need to then reconstruct something for the bladder, um, we had to start debating. So the orthotopic bladder would not have been possible. They wanted to do an Indiana pouch. The Indiana pouch compromised the blood supply from the ileus um, colic artery. So all the left sided colon was dependent on the mid colic artery. And with that limitation, we would not be able to reach with the left sided redo col um, uh, low anterior resection. So the patient had to cho choose would he prefer to have urinary continence or would he prefer to have a colonic continence? And he elected to have the continent cutaneous reservoir, but on the other hand, a colostomy. So in summary, um, again, these um, operations provide substantial challenges in terms of the anatomy. And again, in order to not um, compromise anything, we need to again, clarify what can be used, what works, what reaches, and most importantly, where is the blood supply coming from such a segment? Thank you very much. And sorry if I took a few minutes longer. Thank you, Andreas. That was, uh, that was an incredible talk and uh, it is very complicated cases and this is definitely harder than HPV surgery. And uh, I, <laughs> I hope a lot of our uh, uh, members here can learn because this is a, you know, a real time uh, problems. You know, we do an operation in the abdomen and we get into this ileal conduit and everything and can be very tough. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the next speaker and I will have uh, Andreas introduce the last two speakers. And um, the next speaker will be um, Dr. Kelly Lavaro. She's an assistant professor of surgery and oncology as well as HPV surgery at John Hopkins University in Baltimore. She's gonna be talking about uh, nav navigating and preserving critical vessels in reoperations. Kelly. Great, thank you. I just wanna thank SSAT for the opportunity to talk tonight. I'm gonna to be talking about navigating and preserving critical vessels in reoperations. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. As an overview, I'm gonna talk about the indications for reoperations, feasibility, preparation, and essential steps. Reoperative surgery is becoming increasingly common as many adults have undergone either bariatric surgery or complex abdominal operations. They can be very challenging. They require skill and thought, and really preparation is key. The indications for these surgeries are oncologic operations following gastric bypass, duodenal switch, esophagectomy, or colonic interposition, previously aborted oncologic operations, bile duct injuries following cholecystectomy after bariatric surgery, enterocutaneous fistulas, creation or takedowns of stoma, small bowel obstructions, and incisional hernias. I'm really going to focus on the first indication here about oncologic hepatobiliary operations following gastric bypass and colonic interposition. So are these feasible and safe? Uh, mostly in the literature, there's case reports and case series. Uh, there was in fact a pancreatic head resection after Roux-en-Y gastric bypass study group that presented their findings at the two uh, 2019 SSAT in a plenary presentation. It was a group of 55 pancreatic surgeons in 28 centers from four different countries. And they collected 96 pancreatic odontectomy patients from 2005 to 2018 who had undergone prior Roux-en-Y gastric bypass surgery. 
they noted in these operative notes 20 different reconstruction methods and found on propensity score matched analysis that there was no difference in major complications between the groups that had had a previous renal gastric bypass and those had, who had not. The major complication rate was 23 versus 27 percent, which was not statistically significant. So we know it's feasible and safe. Um, talk about the essential steps. The first one uh, being patient selection. These patients often have comorbidities and nutritional deficiencies, especially those who had undergone previous bariatric surgery. You want to review the previous operative notes in a hospital course, review any outside imaging, and obtain your own high quality imaging. It really takes a team approach and then also careful operative technique. So I'm going to go through each one of these. In terms of preparation, it's really important to, under, to look at the previous operative note if you were not the operative surgeon, and even if you were, just to refresh your memory of the anatomy of the patient and the case. These operative notes will really outline the anatomy and are especially important after ruin y gastric bypass or a colonic interposition. There are multiple reconstruction methods for each of these, uh, and so it's important to know which one was used in your patient. It's also important to know the vascular pedicle that was used for a colonic interposition. So most colonic interpositions, I put a picture up in the top right corner, are really fed off of the middle colic artery and the marginal artery is what keeps that interposition uh, conduit alive. And so it's critical when you're operating to really make sure that the marginal artery and the middle colic artery are spared. It also may tell you what additional vessels were ligated at the time of surgery and identify any challenges the previous surgeon had so that you can anticipate and avoid if possible. You also wanna review the previous discharge summaries to identify complications such as a post-operative leak or gastrogastric fistula that may cause additional issues for you in the operating room. This is a CT scan of a 58 year old woman uh, we had here who had a previous gastric by, ruin y gastric bypass in 2010, and she was found to have a periampulary mass. And I'm going to show you her CT scan. This is the arterial phase, and you can know, I'm going to stop it right here. She actually had an axial stent placed between her remnant uh, stomach and the, her gastric pouch, uh, and this allowed the endoscopist to do an endoscopic ultrasound and biopsy. You can also note here why it's so important is that you can see she actually has a replaced right hepatic artery coming off of her SMA. I have her venous images on the right hand side and that shows so she has a, a periampulary really pancreatic head mass and you can see that there's 180 degrees of abutment of the portal vein so we know going in that this is going to be uh, an issue. So we, I recommend getting high quality imaging. We're very lucky uh, to have a radiologist who's very interested in 3D reconstructions here. So um, these are reconstructions of our CT scans and it makes it really a uh, great picture and clarity in terms of what you're going to anticipate for that particular case. Also as important as the anatomy and defining that is uh, identifying to really identify the patient's needs. You want to assess their preoperative nutritional status. There are multiple validated tools available for this, which I'm not going to go into tonight, um, but you can get a pre-albumin level. We all know that's not perfect, but it's certainly one factor. And you really want to address any deficits preoperatively. Again, these patients who've had bariatric surgery can have uh, multiple nutritional deficiencies. It's really important to discuss, and I don't have to tell anyone this, the risks and benefits of the operation as well as set expectations. These cases are certainly can be longer uh, than your normal cases, requiring a uh, longer uh, length of general anesthesia. And you're also, your setup is going to be different. If the patient's had a ruin y gastric bypass, you want to talk to them about um, resecting the remnant, uh, the gastric remnant, if you're planning on doing that. You want to allow for appropriate focus. I think all of our calendars uh, probably look like the one on the right. It's really important uh, to focus on your patient, especially in these big complex reoperations, uh, and potentially not booking a second case, you know, and freeing up your schedule. You also want to stack the deck. 
I'm going to discuss the case with the day of surgery team, your anesthesiologist. So make sure they have appropriate access and blood products available. Uh, you may want to identify a second set of hands that'll be around in the hospital the day of the surgery in case there's any issues. Uh, and if there's any concern, you could also consult vascular surgery beforehand so they know about the case. So you want to plan out your operative approach. You want to outline the current anatomy like we talked about earlier and really know um, what your reconstruction plan is going to be. So in the case of uh, pancreatic duodenectomy after a ruin Y, uh, the things you need to think about are whether or not you're gonna do a remnant gastrectomy. And if not, you may have to make sure you drain uh, the remnant stomach. And then you wanna think about whether or not your BP limb is adequate for reconstruction. Now, you may not be able to tell this before the operating room, but you, uh, I want to have a backup plan just in case it's not. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because we're going to talk about the vascular issues here. So in terms of intraoperative technique, uh, John Hunter once said, we anticipate a day when surgery will require neither a knife nor a large hole. I think this is not a case for either one of those. Um, so I am a huge proponent of robotic surgery, especially in HPB, and it's a, a large part of our practice here at Johns Hopkins, but these are not generally the cases that uh, we do robotically, we tend to do these open. The uh, bariatric surgery really has changed, you know, as Dr. Hutter had talked about earlier, uh, most of them are done minimally invasive, but we certainly do have a large number of people out there who have had open uh, room wide gastric bypasses or colonic interpositions. And so you make the incision as big as necessary to get adequate access. You want to start the dissection in an area that's accessible, and hopefully that is not previously part of the operation, and work from known to unknown. So for patients who've had a ruin Y gastric bypass and you're doing a pancreatic duodenectomy, you really want to work from the right to left side, cocorize the duodenum, make sure um, that you're able to identify the SMV and portal vein. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, in the upcoming slides. Uh, and then I don't have to tell surgeons, you know, soft tissue handling is really important in these cases. So when we're doing these operations, if there's any concern um, for any vasculature involved, loop out proximal distal control for any of these and all of these vessels. Uh, you can see here, uh, the patient's head is to the right. They're, tumor is stuck is in the pancreatic head and adherent to the portal vein SMB confluence. So you need to identify any vascular reconstructions that's necessary to complete the operation and whether or not that's feasible in that patient. So especially of importance in a colonic interposition that's fed off of the middle colic artery, you know, that tends to be the vessel that uh, can be involved with tumor. And so if that is the case, then you, you have to know that that would be the point of the operation that if you transect the middle colic of a colonic interposition, your conduit's going to die. And then you need to identify the feasibility of reconstruction if you are able uh, to reconstruct that vessel. And so there's kind of two different situations here. Uh, one would be planned uh, vascular resection and reconstruction, and obviously the other one is uh, inadvertent injury uh, to one of the vessels. So in the porta, I'd say the most common uh, injury would be to the portal vein or SMV. Um, and so you need to have bailout options. So if you have not committed yourself to the operation, which at all times, you know, throughout the case, you have to think about what step will commit you to that operation for the pancreatic duodenectomy, transecting the pancreas, um, will commit you, uh, and then you can consider aborting the case at that point. If you've already committed, and it is a vascular injury of the portal vein or the SMV, you need to first get control. Um, so in the case of the portal vein, you would have already done your coker maneuver, put your left hand behind uh, the pancreatic head and put some dental and put pressure on it. 
Do you wanna allow anesthesia time to resuscitate? You need to assess your injury. Uh, so this is the time if you have uh, an extra set of hands around uh, to ask for a little bit of help because uh, two sets of hands are always better. If it's a non-essential vessel, um, obviously you can ligate it, but if it's essential, then there are really three different, four different options in terms of uh, dealing with the vascular injury. Uh, primary repair would be uh, the ideal, either a 5-O-proline on the portal vein or SMV. If for some reason your repair stitches uh, cause the vessel to be narrowed, um, then you'd have to consider doing a patch, either using peritoneum, which is very easily accessible, the falciform ligament, or bovine pericardium. Uh, other options include reimplantation or interposition graft from the IJ, the left renal vein, cadaver, or PTFE. And the other thing you want to consider if you've had a vascular injury in these patients is consider a two-stage operation. If you've had significant blood loss from an injury, a vessel that you're able to repair and you've committed yourself to the operation, consider packing the abdomen, bringing to the ICU for resuscitation and warming the patient and bringing them back 24 to 48 hours later uh, to complete the reconstruction. And then when to stop. Uh, ideally before a vascular injury, <laughs> but certainly before you've committed yourself to the operation. And that's really the most important thing to consider when you're Reoperating on patients with altered anatomy. And then also with any instability, as I just said, you know, consider a two staged operation if your patient becomes unstable in the operating room. And then, so in conclusion, preparation is critical for these patients and knowing the anatomy for the colonic interposition, you know, the middle colic artery and middle colic vein are what feed and drain your conduit. And if there's injury to these or the marginal artery, then your conduit uh, will not survive. So in order to really prepare for this, imaging is key, good quality imaging, and then resources available on the day of the operating room, and then identify the point of no return. So for every operation, that's going to be different. Uh, and so I didn't go through them individually. But before going in, that is key uh, to have in your mind at all times, at what point you've committed yourself to the operation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. That was an excellent talk. Um, again, as, I, as we said in the beginning, we'll um, reserve the discussion for the end of the entire webinar. Um, our next speaker is, uh, Robert Lim. He's a professor of surgery at the University of Oklahoma School of Medicine in uh, Tulsa. And he's going to talk to us about the management of anastomotic complications during the no persons period, bleeding, obstruction, and leak. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaiser. And I want to thank the SSAT for putting on these outstanding webinars and thank my uh, co-faculty for presenting such outstanding material uh, as a uh, bariatric and uh, ge emergency general surgeon. Uh, it's always fascinating to me uh, how much goes into the thought process from some of the other subspecialties. And these talks are certainly no, uh, are certainly a good indication of all the complexity. So uh, thank you. Uh, again, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the no persons period. Uh, when I was uh, a young resident, uh, after about 10 days, we were always talking about thought, you don't really want to go back in that belly at that time. I think that's more of an open surgery uh, um, concern. Nowadays, with so many things being laparoscopic, uh, it's not as dangerous. However, there are still some pitfalls, and that's what we're here to discuss today. Uh, again, thank you to the SSAT for putting this uh, outstanding webinar on. This is my disclosure. It has uh, no relevance to the topic today. And this is my outline. Basically, I'm going to talk about what I think is the incidence and occurrence of uh, these uh, complications, bleedings, obstructions, and leaks. And then I'm going to talk about the decision tree about when to call IR, when to use an open approach, when to use the laparoscope, and when to use the endoscope. And I think for the emergency general surgeons out there, um, we should be facile in, in knowing 
all of these techniques, obviously maybe not doing IR techniques, but at least knowing when to call and when it's, it's best to, to use these, uh, the, these different techniques. Uh, and then finally talk about, a little, about some of the pitfalls and other thoughts that I have regarding this topic. I'll be talking from the perspective of the either the operating surgeon who's done this procedure or the acute care surgeon who might be seeing uh, this uh, these patients. Um, uh, I live in a, a community setting type of hospital, although we're associated with the university, which is where I work. Uh, but we get a lot of patients from other uh, hospitals outside of the Tulsa area who've had other surgeries somewhere else. And they come to us uh, and they have emergency procedures and their operating surgeon is in a different uh, town or a different state. And sometimes even in a different country. Uh, we get a lot, unfortunately a few bariatric patients that go to Mexico, it being relatively close to get their surgery and then we get them afterwards. I mentioned before post-op day 10, uh, that's sort of the traditional thought of being the uh, no person's period, but I've, I've actually, in my perspective, I've moved down to day five, mostly because a lot of these patients that I'll be talking about are already discharged to home. And there's a lot of comfort we think of discharging people to home, uh, that things must be good, but as you'll see in some of the data I present that um, most of the complications happen after that period. Again, focusing on some of the topics we were talked about, uh, bariatric patients, the colorectal, uh, gastric uh, procedures, and then the HPV type procedures, basically anytime the anatomy is altered afterwards. Uh, a word about bariatric, you heard Dr. Hutter eloquently discuss the uh, Ruinwai gastric bypass, and I will steal his picture. Uh, you can tell we both train in the same town. Um, and again, this is the classic ruin wine gastric bypass, but there's also several other ones you might find out there that are very similar. And I try to think of them as basically extended ruin wine gastric bypasses or B2 anastomoses for uh, ruin wine gastric bypass. And in this picture, this is the duodenal switch, and hopefully you can see my uh, pointer here, but you see that this is, again, what we call, what Dr. Hutter called the pouch. And in the switch, it's a sleeve, so this prostomic, there's no slew stomach. The stomach is just removed and then past the pylorus and the first portion of the duodenum, you have what would be the rule limb or the elementary limb. And then this long rest of the duodenum becomes your BP limb and it, it connects down here to where you have a, a common channel down here. This ends up being about 150 to 200 centimeters in length, the common channel. So a very, very long bypass, but essentially a long uh, bypass, if you will, gastric bypass, if you will. So this is the pouch. This is the rule limb or elementary, elementary limb. This is the BP limb and then the common channel. Uh, and so that's the duodenal switch, which you may see more and more out there uh, of in your practice. You also may see what's called the uh, SADI or the single anastomosis duodenal ileal bypass. Again, you have your sleeve anatomy right here, uh, but instead of doing a, a, like a bypass, you have kind of a B2 anastomosis. So you get this long uh, biliopancreatic limb or the afferent limb, if you will. It connects here to the first portion of the duodenum, and then you have this long efferent limb. Uh, this limb tends to be about 250 to 300 centimeters. There's some debate on how long it should be, uh, but for the purposes of the emergency general surgeon, just know that this is a possibility. Uh, the last one I'll talk about is the mini gastric bypass. It's a procedure of some controversy in the United States still, but not internationally. Uh, basically, again, instead of that little pouch the size of an egg that Dr. Hunter talked about, this is a little bit longer. Uh, and then you have an efferent limb and a, e, uh, sorry, afferent limb and an efferent limb, like kind of like a B2 again, where the amount of bypass uh, intestine, again, results in the malabsorption, uh, leading to the weight loss and the metabolic change. Now, one thing you can be certain for your patients who might come in who have had bariatric surgery uh, and had some kind of bypasses, they probably don't know. They probably don't know what they, what they had. Uh, most of the time it is gonna be a rubric gastric bypass. However, don't be surprised if, in, if you have to open up a deer exploration or you get your CT scan when it may be any one of these variants. Now, the one other thing about this though, from the EGS point of view, is that the symptoms are gonna be the same. If you have a leak or a bleed or obstruction, um, the same symptoms you might have for a bleeding or for a leak will be the same regardless if it's a switch or a bypass, a true gastric bypass or a mini gastric bypass, et cetera, et cetera. The signs and symptoms are kind of the same. So again, uh, talking again from the perspective of an acute care surgeon and the date, the last sort of uh, introduction thing I'll say is that in my estimation, a deep space surgical site infection is the same as a leak. Now this is an area of the debate also, and I'm sure some people will fight me on this, but 
in my way of thinking of things, if you have a, a deep surgical site infection or, or an abscess, uh, at least you have to rule out a leak or treat it like a leak uh, until it's controlled and then make sure it doesn't happen again. So if you think of this as just a, a deep space infection and you drain it, say, percutaneously, but you don't image the uh, anastomosis or at least, at least investigate it somehow, like endoscopically, then I think you end up ultimately might be your patient's at this service. Um, so it, I, I, it's better for me in my practice, and I think for most practices, to, to just treat it as a leak. Um, so as I said before, I, 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 um, uh, these are the four areas that I sort of focused on, we concentrate on, and this numbers is a summation of the literature. It's not any one study. Some of it is uh, NISQIP data. Some of it is MBS AQIP data. Some of it is cancer registry. Some of it is large databases from the states that typically uh, have larger uh, uh, um, databases and even the largest series. And so this is kind of the average. Uh, it's sort of simplistic. There's too many numbers to, to think about really if you, if you ask me, but in these particular um, fields, um, you have uh, the amount of bleeding on average that you might see, et cetera, et cetera, for the each of the fields, and amount of time they need reoperation. So fortunately, they don't need that many reoperations for the most part. HPB uh, has the most, but I'm not an HPB surgeon, so please don't be upset with me. Uh, that's just what I read uh, from the literature. Uh, the other part of that is... Um, uh, when is this no person's period? When do these things typically happen? And the reoperation rate, you say, typically happen, as you see, after that five day period, which is why I say that, that that's why I changed the time around to the five to 30 days as opposed to 10 days. And again, most patients, even if you're doing a uh, Whipple procedure, are home by, uh, by this time. So they're not in the hospital. Uh, and so one thing uh, is that we, as clinicians, still have to be. Um, uh, available to them, especially when they go home or notify our emergency rooms, this is who you call. If this is happening or that our patients know, uh, somehow there should be some good communication between the patients and where they might go and to where the surgeon is uh, so they can uh, help with the complications should they happen. Uh, and again, the reason why, aside from the fact that there is a morbidity, there's a mortality that's associated with it and it can be pretty high depending on the surgery. And of course, depending on the indication for the surgery. So these numbers are, are pretty high in some of them, but again, these are maybe the sicker patients who've had gastric cancers and whatnot. Um, so uh, the easiest way to define or treat these patients, or at least, at least the easiest decision tree anyway, is to decide if they're stable or unstable. Because if they're hemodynamically unstable, uh, they present with hypertension, they present with a septic picture, then that's usually a pretty easy uh, decision tree they need to be operated on. Uh, the same thing if they have persistent tachycardia. So if you have tachycardia and you do your workup for whatever you think might be causing the tachycardia and that's negative, then my advice or my recommendation is to operate to make sure you don't have a leak going on in there or you don't have some other process. Um, so again, especially in the case of bariatric patients, uh, if you have a radiologic negative study for a leak, say, like a CT scan or even a swallow study, if they're still tachycardic, to me, that's a pretty fairly easy decision tree. They should get another, another operation to look and see with their own two eyes uh, that they are not leaking. Because a leak that persists uh, will, uh, will be worse. The longer you wait, the worse it's going to be. Uh, and the patients will uh, have a higher risk of, uh, of, of, of succumbing if that's the case. Uh, whether to not to do the LOP or laparoscopic approach, obviously, as individuals based on your comfort level. Uh, but I would say that if the surgery was originally done laparoscopic, that's probably a better, uh, it's probably a better chance of finishing laparoscopic if you have to go back in them, whether they're stable or unstable, I might add. And incidentally, there's a growing uh, amount of data that favors the MIRSI approach in emergency general surgery situations. So even with leaks, even with succus, even with uh, pus and stool, uh, there is some data. Now, this is database data, large retrospective studies. This is, and it is risk stratified, but it doesn't take into account this, the, how well or, uh, or bad the patient looks beforehand or necessarily the skill set of the surgeon or the, or the ability of the hospital. Uh, but it does say that if the patients um, uh, can be done op uh, laparoscopically, then there is some data favoring that approach but certainly no harm in opening, or no one should feel bad about having to open in these hemically unstable patients. 
ultimately you have to have vision. And I think most of us who do MIS will tell you sometimes the vision is much better laparoscopically than it is open. Uh, certainly is the case in uh, the uh, obese patients and in the case of patients who have small pelvises, uh, like the uh, larger men who tend to have small pelvises, so getting down there can be very difficult. Uh, very, I have a very low threshold for adding endoscopy to my uh, exploration. So uh, in addition to telling the OR I want to do a laparoscopic approach for these patients, I'll also ask them to do the endoscope, put, bring the endoscope in the room, uh, just in case I have to look uh, through that way. Um, in the foregut anyway, uh, so we're talking about any of your gastric resections, uh, some of the pancreatic or duodenectomies, uh, and some of the bariatric patients. Uh, it is sometimes very hard to control that leak. So if you're in there and there's this, it's just uh, very inflamed tissue, there's gastric contents, there's, there's pus, uh, obviously you want to control that by washing it out uh, and draining it, um, to at least two drains in there. Um, and you may even try and throw some sutures to control the leak and they just pull right through. Uh, you may try putting a, a, a gram patch type of a modification up there to control the leak, which is certainly something you could do, but even those sutures may not hold very well. Um, if in that situation you can control by just washing in the uh, area out widely and widely draining it, but one very important thing that you should do is put a feeding tube in somewhere. As Dr. Hutter said, uh, you can always put it in the excluded stomach and be careful, don't say remnant because your radiologist may put it in the wrong spot. Uh, but uh, for you, if you're in the operating room, you could put it in any part of the jejunum that's there. You can put it in the room itself. You can put it in the biliopancreatic limb. Uh, you can put it in the common channel, but give your, your patients some form of enteral access uh, that gives them, I think, better nutrition. And a lot of times it can be controlled initially and then with good nutrition, drainage and antibiotics, this can be, this can be a little closed naturally on its own with some time. Uh, so post-operatively, you keep them NPO and again, nutrition support. And then re-image at that time, the hole uh, may be likely smaller or minimal. And then you can try some of your endoscopic means to close it. You can clip these, you can stent them sometimes. Uh, sometimes they're sizable, but you can put a sponge in them and do like a wound vac. Uh, and those have actually very good success, about 80% or so success of closing these uh, leaks without having to do another reoperation uh, on them. So don't forget to in, uh, employ your endoscopic colleagues uh, to close these leaks. Um, moving on to the colorectal disease. Again, uh, if you're in a hemodynamically unstable patient and they have pus all over their abdomen, from perforated diverticulitis or uh, some other something else, um, perhaps a malignant obstruction that resulted in, in, a, uh, uh, in a perforation, um, you've got to go in and control that septic picture. So you go in and wash out and, and certainly drain a lot. And in the case of colorectal, the one difference is you can perform a proximal diversion. Uh, which I would do, uh, especially in the hemodynamically unstable patient. Now, there is some controversy whether to revise uh, if it's a, a post-op uh, patient. Obviously, we're talking that, I'm sorry, I apologize. We're talking that uh, population here versus just doing a resection and a proximal reversion. And the data will tell you that both are acceptable, uh, but you, it, it's, it depends on which area you're, you're talking about. Um, certainly, the low rectal and anal anastomosis are very difficult to repair and probably not the thing you wanna do in the acute setting. And so you'll likely just do a, a resection and a, a, and a diversion in that, in that patient. However, in the more, maybe perhaps in the more proximal ones, perhaps in the sigmoid or in the uh, left or right hemicolectomies, um, a, a revision is possible in, that, in those situations. But um, I think if you're right, you can be right either way, along with, as long as you have the, the uh, um, proper patient. However, the key though, uh, if you're going to sort of do one-stop shopping as an emergency zone surgery, is make sure you do your proper washout and drainage and uh, some form of diversion, even if you are going to revise. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's probably the safest thing, safest thing you can do for these patients. Uh, and then once you've done that, then there are, again, endoscopic means to close later on once, uh, if, if you have, if you've decided to uh, uh, just revise or just to drain uh, with the proximal um, uh, diversion and then later on come back and close, uh, convert them, your, your ostomy back to uh, uh, an incontinuity uh, colon. Um, 
Now, a lot of patients prevent more stably, though, especially in the colorectal world, and they can uh, be trained, they can again be treated with just IR drainage and some IV antibiotics. Again, focusing on nutrition afterwards. And then again, in the stable leaks, uh, if the, the IR drainage, drainage and um, initial uh, and the nutrition initial nutrition don't uh, close it, then there are endoscopic means. And if that fails, you can always do a reoperation. However, I would give this some time, say shovel once before I went back in uh, uh, and avoiding operating in that early period. Uh, this will, of course, though prolong the hospitalization. Uh, and there is a little bit of controversy whether to just reoperate initially. However, I think that um, I, my personal thought is that if the patients can be treated uh, with drainage and nutrition and maybe endo endoscopy, uh, that's probably better for them versus the, the reoperation. Um, <clears throat> moving on to bleeding, again, I'm going to avoid the, I'm going to just say if they're hemolytic stable and they think they're bleeding, then they have to go to the operating room. I don't think there's any controversy in that one. Uh, but if they are stable or stable-ish, if you will, then obviously the treatment would be the reverse to coagulopathy. And I would consider doing elastography. A lot of patients in the uh, gastric uh, HP world, B world and even the bariatric world uh, have some co underlying coagulopathies. Uh, and the standard PT, INR, PTT will not give you the information you need as to whether or not these patients uh, are coagulopathic. Uh, transfuse as necessary, but I like to have a set amount of time to transfuse. So uh, while this may be a little bit in the area of controversy, um, I don't like to just keep transfusing and transfusing and transfusing. Um, you know, if you get the eight, 10 units, um, I think that uh, the, the, the risks uh, uh, outweigh some of the benefits sometimes, I will say that. And so in your mind, if you think, okay, I'm going to keep transfusing, if I get up to eight um, and they're still sort of, you know, uh, stable-ish, but they keep bleeding, then maybe it's time to go in and just, and just uh, find the bleeding source and stop it on your own. Uh, when you do that and you go back in and, and inspect the bleeding sites and the ones that you're looking to look at are getting your staple lines, regardless of how you did the surgery before, any of the anastomotic or staple lines, of course, um, any of the retraction sites. So in laparoscopy, especially a lot of times we retract it as off the screen and we never really see what we're doing uh, with, the, with that retractor or that uh, um, instrument. Uh, and that can be the source of bleeding afterwards. Uh, don't forget intraluminal bleeding. So it can bleed inside of the, uh, the, the uh, anatomy and they can present with either a melana or hematochesia or hematemesis. Uh, or they may not present much at all because all the bleeding is sort of held inside the anatomy. I mean, eventually it will come out, but again, it may not be obvious that they're bleeding into luminous. So again, um, <clears throat> sorry, let me back up a second. So if they are bleeding, I think it is important to consider uh, looking at the foregut vessels to consider IR. Dr. Um, Hunter gave a great example of that with the splenic uh, injury. Um, and so uh, along with your deciding when to transfuse or go to the operating room, that should be considered. And if you're thinking about intraluminal things, then again, you know, look for endoscopic endoscopy. And that can be done on the table or in combination uh, of you doing your uh, operative, operative control. Um, so these are the sites and these, I think this is when you might consider doing those things, especially in the bleeding patient. Uh, moving on to obstructions, uh, I think in the anatomically altered, uh, some of the things change with your approach to that. Uh, again, you're gonna start keeping them NPO and with IV fluid. But as, I, as Dr. Hunter showed you uh, and Dr. Lawson, a lot of times you're crossing over other pieces of intestine. There's a lot of, NK, a lot of reasons to have a, a closed loop obstruction. So an NG tube may not be very uh, beneficial to you, uh, at, least at, least in telling, at least in terms of uh, resolving the small bowel obstruction. It may give some relief, but it likely won't resolve the small bowel obstruction. Uh, I still recommend doing it, however, uh, it's a little bit different than, say, the patient who had open surgery 20 years ago and now presents with a small bowel obstruction, from like, likely from adhesive disease in that situation. This is more likely to be uh, a closed loop, uh, and that should be taken into consideration. And as such, I don't think I would wait for very long. So if they're immediate post-op and they didn't have a true on bowel obstruction, uh, even if they're stable, um, I think this is more likely going to be from a closed loop or some of the anatomy altering situations. And I would give them time. Sometimes you give them uh, these small bowel obstructions and come in, you say, okay, I'll decompress them and I'll wait and, and until they push me to the OR. And sometimes four or five days later, they open up. 
uh, and you avoid having to do a big operation. But in the early post-operative period, I think I would go earlier. A lot of us use the gastrographic challenge uh, after uh, the situation where it's an open surgery or previous surgery in the remote past, uh, because the gastrogram, I think one helps identify where it also can help be some therapeutic at some point. But again, I'm, but again, because this is more likely to be closed loop and because um, it, this is a different mechanism or a different animal, I don't, I'm not sure what the gastrogram challenge might show to us uh, in the early post-operative period. So I don't typically use it in the, uh, the post-operative period. Um, <clears throat> when operating on any of these patients, uh, these are sort of my MIS tips, especially going to go MIS. You've heard uh, Dr. Lawson talk about being very generous with the tissue, and I couldn't agree more, uh, especially with big dilated bowel. Um, those, uh, you pinch it in the wrong area, and now you can cause your own perforation, and you're going to wish you uh, hadn't, or you wish you just don't open to begin with, because now you have a whole bunch of things. Uh, I like this instrument here. Sometimes it's called the slot or it's called the Johan grasper. It's four centimeters long. It has a width of four centimeters when it's wide open. And the tips meet, but the, the back end does not meet uh, here when you close it. So there's a little bit of a gap. So it doesn't completely crush the tissue or pinch as much of the tissue as you think it, it would. It's actually a pretty gentle uh, instrument. So that's, that's why I like it, especially for my bowel corrections or I'm touching tissue that uh, I want to move around and not tear because I think it's so inflamed. Uh, so you got to know your instruments. I think using a Maryland, for instance, to do a, to, to move bowel around for a bowel obstruction, uh, you're probably going to pinch it and you're probably going to get a tear. Uh, if you're going back in, you don't have to release every adhesion. I think this takes up a little bit of time. I don't think you're necessarily preventing adhesions from happening again. And again, you're looking again for that closed loop obstruction or the internal hernia that Dr. Hunter talked about or something with the anatomy that's causing it. And again, if there are adhesions down the road or something like that, those will not have to be released. Um, and again, uh, and then not again, but uh, one thing that we're, I'm big on is watching your surgical energy, especially with my residents and fellows. Um, you know, you gotta know what you're using and it doesn't really matter if you use the harmonic scalpel or the uh, ligature or just straight monopolar. If you don't know how you're doing, you're gonna cause problems. So watch your straight energy. Most of the time when I do my dissections, uh, I don't use any energy unless there's a, a definite band or something that I can define and maybe there's a vessel pumping it uh, before I divide it. Otherwise I'm more of a cutter uh, and a, a retractor to get to be where I need to be because I think the other way it causes too many uh, injuries. Uh, one other thing that I like to do is label the limbs. So when you're doing expiration, you heard Dr. Harder say you start from the distal, from the ilium and work your way back. I think that's a great technique. But as I get to the anastomosis, I always put a clip. Uh, I always label my uh, limbs. So the common channel gets three clips, the root limb gets one, and the BP limb gets two clips. And the reason why I do this is because once you let go and you're in your field, you go to another part to sort of undo some stuff, you sort of forget which limb is which, but you can identify using those, those uh, clips. And then at least it tells you where things ought to be, and then you can work to getting your bowel obstruction or whatever back uh, to where uh, it should be in doing the, un uh, doing the untwisting. But one of the frustrating things I think about doing, especially a bowel obstruction um, after bariatric surgery, is uh, forgetting which limb is which. And uh, no big surprise to anybody here that they all look alike once they're uh, in the operating room uh, laparoscopically. So um, <clears throat> Don't forget the port sites as a source of your hernias. This is a robotic port site here that I was asked to take care of. And uh, they're supposed to be eight millimeters. Uh, I don't have a measuring stick here, but that, that's clearly longer than eight millimeters or larger than eight millimeters. And then a piece of bowel, doesn't have to be a whole lot, can get stuck in there and cause a bowel obstruction. Uh, these are actually kind of easy to identify and treat. Uh, you just undo, you just pull the bowel down gently. And then I, I usually just throw a transfacial suture in this space through, through the incision, uh, through two or three of them uh, to close off that defect. All right, uh, finishing up here, I just want to take a, a word about afferent limb syndrome, because I think it's mislabeled. And I think basically it's a bowel obstruction, especially in the earlier post-op period. Uh, but it may be a little mislabeled and maybe a little bit misunderstood. Uh, again, it's initially it's from the B2 anastomosis, so it's from the afferent limb coming in, and there's usually an obstruction here or a kink here or something like that, that causes an obstruction of this afferent limb, uh, which can cause pain, it can cause some vomiting uh, that's not related to eating, um, it can cause uh, some uh, uh, vomiting of, uh, of things that don't look like stomach contents. 
But in the literature, the afferent limb is also, can also be recognized as the BP limb shown over here. And so this, again, BP limb can be obstructed. It can cause problems. Now, if this gets obstructed, it goes back into the excluded stomach. That can be very painful um, and because it can cause distension of the uh, excluded stomach. Um, and uh, it just it just needs, I think for the, this audience, just needs that's a possibility, especially after the, in the early uh, uh, post um, surgical period. So this triangle here labels what I think is the afferent limb in this kind of anastomosis. And in this kind of anastomosis here, it would be here. And those can get obstructed also and cause problems afterwards. <clears throat> uh, in, in homage to our HPB surgeons, this is a, this is the different types of, uh, of reconstructions you can have after a pancreatic do, do a denectomy. And lots of things can be considered the afferent limb in this one. Uh, and in here, uh, before it gets to the connection here, uh, and in this particular anastomosis type here. And again, I'm not an HPB surgeon. I don't do this operation. However, uh, knowing the anatomy, knowing where it could come from, I think is important. And knowing that this limb can become obstructed also is important. Uh, and incidentally, there are, uh, what was kind of fascinating to me, sometimes this can present as cholangitis or with a dilated, uh, 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 excuse me, hepatic ducts, because again, the obstruction here and it just refluxes back up into the uh, biliary system, uh, causing problems there. But it's all due to an obstructed limb here, which usually needs reconstruction to fix, especially in the early postoperative period. Um, it's not as common as it is in the late upper period. Uh, usually needs a rescission, uh, of sure the revision, excuse me, that's my changer. Uh, and it should be considered kind of a closed loop obstruction because again, the, the limb that leads from wherever the, the uh, proximal one at the anastomosis becomes obstructed uh, and causes uh, problems that way. And then I said it can result in some cholangitis. Um, just a quick word about hernias. There's a tendency for, for especially for the larger hernias, not the smaller ones that I showed from the port site. Um, but the larger hernias, uh, there's some thought that maybe I, I've, I've just fixed the, the uh, obstruction or the bleeding or whatever. Maybe I should go ahead and fix this uh, hernia at the same time. Uh, and and the, this is again, focused on the early post op period. I would not do that. I would save it for another day, get, take care of the problem that's in front of you and then leave that big hernia complex abdominal reconstruction for at some other time. And then my final thoughts are, uh, we focus on things that are more or less in the subspecialties of a VAR, uh, of, our, uh, of a general surgeon. Um, so we have some basic, uh, we have some essential knowledge of those uh, different subspecialties, but oftentimes we get consulted on urology as uh, Dr. Kaiser talked about, and even OBGYN. So this is a big ovarian tumor that uh, my, one of my colleagues in the OBGYN world took out. Uh, obviously this was an open procedure because even if he could Mobilize everything laparoscopically. That was not going to come out through a uh, centimeter size incision. Uh, but this was a very large tumor in a very young lady, a 35 year old female undergoing a THPSO for stage uh, three uh, ovarian cancer. And she did very well for about four days, was eating, was about to go home, but then became tachycardic uh, on the morning of post op day number five. They obtained a CT scan and the scout or the portable KEB showed this large gastric bubble over here. The CT scan later on again confirmed that large gastric bubble. Um, and um, the rest of the CT scan showed you can see down here is a little bit of a transition point down here. Uh, and on this uh, slide here is a little transition point, but it was also with some free fluid in the abdomen, I mean, excuse me, in the pelvis. And they had consulted colorectal uh, and looking concerned for a leak, which is a concern. However, I don't think it, it did not address the main problem. And um, uh, they recommended doing a drain. Uh, at this time, it was early in the evening. IR said we'll do the drain tomorrow. Uh, and unfortunately, this poor lady remained tachycardic overnight. Uh, by the next morning, her heart rate had gone up to 150. She became hypotensive. Uh, I was taking the OR and posted down to six. So this is my hand in here now. And you can see this sort of necrotic tissue, uh, which was part of the stomach. Basically, the stomach fell apart inside my hands when I was there. And this air was pointing down to the remnant of what's remaining of the post, or excuse me, the proximal stomach. It's really just a little numb and almost like the gastric pouch from the gastric bypass. Although you can see a lot of inflammation around there and a lot of problems. Uh, left there in discontinuity initially, uh, but unfortunately over the time, this is the picture we saw because of just too much necrosis, too much uh, hypotension and pressure support. 
Uh, eventually she lost most of her small bowel and then eventually because of her, uh, her poor prognosis from ovarian cancer, uh, the she, she, family elected to withdraw care on her after about 60 days of uh, attempting uh, resuscitation and care for her. And unfortunately she passed. Uh, but the story behind this one is that we again focused on uh, the general surgery um, uh, specialties, but there are the specialties that work around the bowel or nearby the bowel, and the complexes don't aren't any different afterwards. Tachycardia needs to go to the operating room. Hypotension uh, you want to do it before it becomes hypotensive and septic, uh, but we should always look out for those things postoperatively uh, that lead lead to catastrophes afterwards. Uh, so in summary, no person's period again days five through thirty is when typically when the complications occur. Uh, the first decision tree is really stability, and if they're not stable, they go to the operating room. If they are stable, then there are some endoscopic and interventional procedures that can be done uh, to uh, control that either the bleed or that leak that doesn't require surgery, uh, and I think to the betterment of the patients. And the decision here uh, ultimately is, uh, has to do with the resources you have in your hospital and what uh, you feel is uh, ultimately best for your patients in terms of the approach. Um, but uh, ultimately, um, we just need to be vigilant about these things and just assume that something bad is going to happen, um, which is, I guess, a very surgical thing to do. Uh, but assume something bad is going to happen and be ever vigilant about it. Uh, that ends my discussion today. I thank you. These are my references, and I thank you for the time. Thank you, Robert, for this excellent overview of um, obviously a complicated uh, time period after um, what is usually designed as a uncomplicated surgery, but complications can happen. So our last talk in the series um, is going to be given by Emily Winslow. She's a professor of surgery at George, Georgetown uh, University and also the um, regional director for MedStar Health System in Hepatobiliary Surgery. Uh, she's going to talk to us about the multidisciplinary approach and the diagnosis and treatment of pancreatic uh, biliary lesions in the setting of altered anatomy. Emily, uh, yeah. thanks for agreeing. Sure, great. Thank you so much. Um, I will try to um, just stick to uh, substance here and, and, and get, get us through here uh, quickly. So um, I'm going to focus on a couple of clinical settings and put most of the emphasis on access to the bile duct um, in the setting of RUI gastric bypass, but also talk uh, briefly about the pancreatic head access for workup and treatment and then obstructions that occur after pancreatic oduodenectomy. So, um, you know, for me, altered anatomy is really things that we're creating and then things that pathology kind of creates after we um, kind of already start the process. So there are, um, I think, both loss of prograde access to the ampulla, and then there's resection of the ampulla and trouble that can occur um, as a result of that. And then these can both be made worse by pathology afterwards. Um, I just want to say briefly, I think it, this is a, a mindset. We think of altered anatomy like a, a small bowel anastomosis or gastro J like this, but you know, I think we have to turn the lens really to what it looks like to our colleagues from the inside. And it's, it's very much like this. This seems very easy to navigate until you're starting to think what it's like to do on the ground. And so I think when we draw pictures and we help really explain things in the way they should be. That is that uh, facilitates a lot of um, easy, easier um, uh, interventions for our endoscopy, our endoscopists and IR colleagues. So, you know, we, I think often are crossing things and putting things overlying. And it seems, I think to us in the operating room, like that is all pretty straightforward. But as you can see, post-operatively, um, if somebody's trying to do uh, an endoscopic um, approach, it can seem very much like a maze. And I think um, this is something that we really need to work very closely as a team um, on specifically. Okay, so I wanna just spend um, uh, the most time talking about this. The, um, any, any reason to have to get to the bile duct after RUI gastric bypass, of course, the most common of which is cholelithiasis. So um, there are, of course, four ways to get here. One is the way we normally do it, somehow through the peritoneal cavity, meaning common bile duct exploration, whether that be robotic or laparoscopic. There's also percutaneously or through the liver. Um, there is retrograde up the duodenum. And then there is access prograde. And I had time to switch this, Dr. Hutter, to through the excluded stomach. 
um, or through this part of the stomach so you can approach the ampulla normally. So I'll go through each of those. Um, just uh, briefly to emphasize um, a, the through the peritoneal cavity or some type of um, operative common bodily exploration, this is easy when the gallbladder needs to come out anyway. This shouldn't be hard if the patient still has a gallbladder in and has cholidocolithiasis and has a gastric bypass, this should just be an R court. And these are um, pictures of um, that setup with a um, um, cholidocoscopy with a spyglass in the operating room and removal of the stones at the time of a cholecystectomy. Um, obviously you can do this with uh, cholangiography as well as, a, as opposed to just um, cholangioscopy. All right, so how about the, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip over the through the liver approach because that's pretty straightforward. I think everybody's familiar with um, the transhepatic approach. But retrograde up the duodenum, um, there are um, uh, multiple names for this. And I think the easiest one is just to call this device assisted enteroscopy. It just means somehow they're gonna use some fancy tools to make this um, come down the limb and back up the other. Um, the two separate challenges in this are both getting there, but once you get there, there's still a pretty big fall off on the uh, ability to do something. So a lot of times they can see the ampule, but they can't really cannulate because both the angle, the stiffness of their scope and their tools are not really meant for this. These are the three type of, um, when we say device-assisted enteroscopy, really what we're talking about, double balloon, single balloon enteroscopy, and then spiral uh, enteroscopy. These intussuscept the bowel and these cor this corkscrews the bowel up so they can uh, make access to come up here. Okay, so what, um, what, what are the differences or how, how do we compare this? I think it's really important to remember that it seems maybe to those of us who don't do a lot of scopes that they're all the same, but they're, they're, they're very much not. The length and the working channel are quite different, whether they are, have the access um, ability to have a water jet and the angle of you all are very uh, important. Um, in terms of the success rate, so this is, um, this is a very, um, I think, useful um, uh, German study that compares, and these were just, um, this is a retrospective study, um, patients who have had um, biliary studies in different types of altered anatomy um, that had it by retrograde endoscopy, like I just described, or percutaneous, the, the, the um, IR uh, transhepatic route. You can see that the success rate of um, going through the liver is just in general much better than it is with endoscopy, but it's still reasonable. More than half of patients can still have a successful endoscopic procedure after um, an anatomy altering procedure, but you see it's very different between the two. So Bill Roth II being the most um, easy for the endoscopist, Whipple being intermediate and a long uh, roof for a gastric bypass, of course, being the worst. Um, this is just a, a similar study um, to show you, this is a meta-analysis and systematic review to show you that the Germans, it's not specific to them, the technical success rate overall um, in terms of a RUI gastric bypass of getting up there is about 60% overall. Okay, oh, I didn't get this one. Okay, so through the excluded stomach, uh, we can do that um, uh, three ways. We can either um, access the stomach for the uh, endoscopist, uh, meaning we can, um, somehow minimally invasively, get the stomach up there, make a hole, let the endoscopist put a scope there. We can do this through a gastrostomy, um, either a surgically placed one, but more commonly a percutaneous gastrostomy, or most importantly, and this is what I wanna talk just a little about, is the endoscopic ultrasound directed transgastric ERCP. Okay, so for the gastrostomy facilitated access, there's obviously an IR per gastrostomy of the excluded stomach. There's a surgical gastrostomy. We, I think everyone is, would be familiar with these. But then there's also a way to, to get a gastrostomy in the remnant stomach from below. Um, so enteroscopy assisted. So the same way they would come back up to the ampulla and just keep coming further into the remnant stomach and then place um, a um, uh, self-expanding metal stent like you see in this uh, photo through the abdominal wall and then scope through it and then leave a gastrostomy at the completion in this um, axis. So this allows prograde access. Um, through the remnant stomach and done all endoscopically. So I think this procedures, these procedures are basically, we can do it without anyone else type uh, gastrostomy access by our endoscopist. And they, um, this, this was the first, and they have these um, kind of variety of names for these, but basically device assisted enteroscopy guided percutaneous transprosthetic endoscopic therapy. Um, so this is what this uh, picture depicts. And then on the next page, I'll show you um, um, a different way for the endoscopist to actually complete what we do surgically, but all percutaneously and using uh, the scope. This is a uh, group from Minnesota. 
who uh, calls this procedure ester, but it's it's basically what you would imagine. They take the um, uh, endoscopic ultrasound, insufflate the remnant um, with a direct axis with a needle. Then they use um, um, sutures to secure the stomach to the abdominal wall. Then they can scope directly through that. Um, this is actually, I, I think, a fairly um, nice collaboration where a minimally invasive surgeon and an um, endoscopist work closely together to develop this. All right, so what about the last one? Uh, the endoscopic directed transgastric access or EDGE procedure. This is basically that staple line that we've been talking about through the whole session, just connecting the staple line of the uh, gastric pouch to the excluded or remnant uh, stomach uh, with a um, axio stent or alumin opposing metal stent like we would use for pseudocyst drainage. And then going through that stent, through the lumen of the stent in a prograde fashion to get to the ampulla. You can do this through whether through the pouch itself, or sometimes they do it through the jejunal limb. Um, same same um, basic issue, one or two stages. Um, and as you can imagine, every, every bariatric surgeon who hears this says, "Well, what about the problem there? Right? You just ruined everything by creating a gastrogastric fistula that I'm going to have to fix." And that's um, that's a real thing. And I I think that the rate, at least when I look at a pooled um, the literature overall, I think the rate is probably. 10%, but it's, it's probably much like hiatal um, hernia repair, where the harder you look, the, the more you'll find. And so a lot of these are the clinical presentation is probably on the order of five to 10%, but, but there may be uh, more patients who don't close depending on how long the um, stent is in. And obviously there are um, uh, complications from this procedure because some of this is kind of um, a blind transperineal. So if this is the interoscopy so, um, um, assisted approach to go up from the bottom, this is the edge procedure. We're just gonna go straight through uh, the staple line and, and press on the normal way. So how does that compare? Um, I think this is the, probably the best um, uh, study of comparing essentially an edge procedure, which is these 30 patients um, on the right to the endoscopic so, um, assisted ERCP. You can see that they're much more successful using um, the edge approach and the procedure times are less. And so I think, you know, that's fairly compelling uh, data to the endoscopist because this is very um, tedious and um, you can imagine it's not something they're excited to do with a long, um, a long procedure time either. Okay, so how did the three compare? If you wanna look across um, devices, uh, um, uh, assisted ERCP, the um, edge, and then what we do in the operating room to facilitate ERCP, you can see that the success rate is definitely probably highest in the operating room, but um, it's very reasonable still for the other methods. Um, and the invasiveness is quite different. And in terms of skill requirement, I like this. One of the skills for the laparoscopic assisted ERCP is you have to actually have the skill of cooperating with the surgeon. So I don't know what that says about us, but okay. So what about getting to the pancreatic head um, after a real-wide gastric bypass? You know, I just want to show this for a second because I think Kelly um, uh, mentioned this is that this is a patient who had a um, um, duodenal switch and um, so has a duodeno jejunostomy, but after the a Whipple procedure, this um, the right gastric artery um, was taken given the tumor and this segment of duodenum essentially died. Um, and so I think we just have to always be attuned to the vascular impact of um, the blood supply to the prior um, anastomoses. Okay, so how do we get there? And then how, how, what about the operations? I know people have mentioned this already, so I'll spend more time just talking about getting there just so we have numbers in our head about is it easy to visualize the pancreatic parenchyma in different segments after um, any type of anatomy altering procedures um, with an endoscopic ultrasound? And um, basically, it really, of course, depends on the operation and which segment of the pancreas you're trying to visualize. And you can see some numbers here, which are small overall for their ends, but I think somewhat useful. Um, you can see that it's least impacted, of course, by sleeve gastrectomy, but it's most difficult for a roux or a total gastrectomy. And then um, a Bilroth II, um, it's a kind of intermediate thing. So you can see that, you know, in some cases, it's quite easy to visualize um, uh, parts of the pancreas in the middle, but really, you know, almost impossible in, an, uh, in a total gastrectomy to see the, the pancreatic head. Um, I, uh, I know Dr. Vollmer's uh, work was alluded to earlier, and so I'll just say that I think it's important important for us to think as surgeons that, that need to uh, take out the pancreatic head, that there really isn't that much impact of um, 
of a prior gastric bypass or even do a denal switch um, on the operation, except it takes good planning to know what was done before. And sometimes the local conditions dictate what needs to be done. Um, and I, I'll skip this, but this is a patient who needed a splenectomy and had an abscess. And so you have to kind of uh, take into account what you're going to do um, based on what, you know, what the specifics of that uh, patient's anatomy are. Okay, how about obstruction at the um, biliary anastomosis after a Whipple? Can, the, um, can we do this minimally invasively? Um, I think um, this is actually, um, normally we just think of this as an IR or percutaneous um, access issue. But um, endoscopically, um, you know, we can attempt this retrograde um, up the uh, pancreatic biliary limb after a Whipple. Um, but more recently, EUS guided hepatogastrostomy has been um, done where basically they use the endoscopic ultrasound to access the left liver through the stomach and place this uh, stent. And that's shown here. Um, in terms of getting their retrograde, um, the, the overall rate of access is not bad. It's in the low 80s, I think, overall. Um, but this method essentially of leaving stents between the stomach and the liver and being able to dilate and stent the bile duct, um, it, these are all options that are modifications um, uh, using EUS that I think are um, really an improvement in quality of life for patients. So um, they, they have a reasonable rate of adverse events though. So in some studies up to 20% of patients will have some issue as a result of this. Um, and the same thing with the pancreatic um, anastomosis, we can similarly access the pancreatic OJ from inside the bowel and place a stent, um, do a cholangia or do a, um, I'm sorry, a um, pancreatic uh, ductoscopy here. Um, but we can also use EUS to access the duct and place a stent and do a pancreatogram from um, upstream and then place a stent that way or leave a wire and access it endoscopically. So I think that the idea is that this is um, an increasingly broad range of interventions that take both our endoscopist um, and um, our interventional radiologists and surgeons to help. So um, I, I'll just say this, that I think we categorize like this endoscopy, percutaneous surgical intervention, although I'm becoming less clear what's what exactly we say is surgical and really, I think if you walk around to these all places all day to do talk to your colleagues doing stuff, really these, these places are not so different um, and they're blending increasingly. And I think it's really important for us to think about um, these particular patients in disease-based care as opposed to the silos of different types of interventions. That's all I have. Great, thank you um, so much for having us. And I'm sorry we've run a little over tonight. Well, thank you, Emily, and uh, all the other speakers for these wonderful presentations. For me, who uh, is not a specialist in most of those specialties, it's really great to see uh, the thoughts and, and uh, complex uh, decision-makings that need to be made in, in many of those areas. Um, we are a little bit over time, but on the other hand, nobody will kick us out. Um, nobody will turn off the uh, power. So I think there is still opportunity to ask a few questions. Um, I may actually start with a question to Kelly. Um, when you do all these, and maybe also for the other ones, when you do these complex um, surgeries where you anticipate maybe there is some vascular involvement, et cetera, and, or you might find a difficult anatomy, et cetera, who do you line up for that surgery? Are you going to do it in a community hospital? Are you going to only do it in the center? Is vascular surgery available? Or t tell me a little bit how you set that up. Um, so thanks so much for that question. So I would say that uh, there are certainly very good community hospitals. These patients are uh, very tricky. So if you're going to attempt it in a community hospital, I would make sure that you do have a vascular surgeon and also you know, the capabilities of interventional radiology uh, to take care of any complications afterwards. But I think these patients are probably best cared for at larger academic centers that have um, people in-house from IR um, you know, and, and large vascular surgery divisions uh, there. But I think it depends uh, ultimately on not only the surgeon's experience, but also the resources that they have available, I think is really important because um, you can get in trouble in the operating room, but also these patients, you know, as we heard from Dr. Lim, can certainly have 
catastrophic complications afterwards. I might just add one one quick thing to to um, what Kelly just said, which is I, I think we have to think always really carefully who in your hospital is the sower of the mesenteric or portal vein. And in some hospitals, it might be vascular surgeons, but I think in many places, it, it's actually trans, liver transplant surgeons or small bowel transplant surgeons or other people. So I think that's always, I think it's really important to have whatever situation you have to have that relationship worked out because it's often a, an urgent and a, I need, you know, somebody needs help. And I think everybody just has to understand who the players are and people have to work really well together in that situation. I, I agree with uh, what Emily just said. You know, I think, you know, I've, I've been uh, in the several situation where, uh, you know, you need a step, second hand of surgeons and you think the vascular surgeons are the help helper. They're actually not the helper because they can only do endovascular and it's not useful, right? You, you need somebody who now has to the old school one, you know, clamp, clamp and so. Um, I, I have a question uh, for Matt, for Matt. You know, the edge procedure that Emily uh, talked about, you know, in, in our hospital, our endoscopies are very aggressive. And they always like call me, hey, you know, can you back me up? I want to do this. Like, I, I don't know I should back you up or not. I, I just want to see what, what your thought, Matt, about this edge procedure that creates a gastrogastric fistula. Um, I just showed you, <laughs> I'm not a huge fan. Um, I, you know, I think we do everything we can to avoid a gastrogastric fistula. It's hard to fix and it's not necessarily necessary. Um, so you know, my, my first exposure was a patient of mine came in who needed access and, um, and I got called by the, the resident saying, oh no, surgeons aren't involved, just the, uh, the, the, the GI doctors are gonna do that. Oh really, well, how are you gonna do that? And we started talking and my first response was, are you gonna do that on a human? And do you have an IRB? And both, both, well, the first one was yes. And the second question was no. But I, I, I mean, I, I love people pushing the envelope. I think for certain places that these, these lumen opposing stents, uh, opposing stents could be very helpful. Um, in this situation, we have other ways to do this. I don't think we need to do that. We're creating a problem that can be very difficult to fix. And so uh, I, there's a lot of other ways to get there. I, 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 two thumbs down from me. I think we have to think really carefully why we're doing it. So the best case in my view is a pancreatic head mass that's not resectable and the patient um, doesn't have tissue and there isn't good percutaneous you know, window. And otherwise you're talking about a surgical biopsy or treating based on you know, a blood uh, DNA, which makes the oncologist very uncomfortable. So sometimes like that, I and that patient in general is gonna have a short life expectancy and a gastrogastric fistula isn't their worst problem. So sometimes there, I think there, right now there are some windows, but I think the problem is right now it's being applied in patients who even perhaps need a cholecystectomy at some point. So that that's the other end of the spectrum to, I think, carefully consider. I think the other thing, uh, it, not so much the gastrogastric fistulas, which I, obviously you can see a lot of that data comes from Owen Kashab. So we deal with them very frequently here at uh, Hopkins, but they do uh, a lot of the, um, gastric hepatic duct stents and or even you know left hepatic duct stents or third order left hepatic duct stents and you really have to look at the imaging beforehand and know you're going to have a hole in the bile duct if you take that out um, so if the patient needs a the surgery they often form very thick fibrotic tracks and they're difficult uh, to repair. So it's something that you have to know. You, you may wind up doing a left lateral sectionectomy uh, if you're not able to repair that. So it's just something you have to think about uh, going into the operation. You know, that, uh, that um, um, connection between the stomach and the, uh, and the left hepatic duct, I've, I've used it a couple of times and I think it's very helpful. I've used it also. I asked my endoscopy to do it. Um, for example, a patient who have like a you know biliary of biliary cancer and had a clad skin tumor and they leaked for some reason they leaked in the portal hepatitis, right? And you you're not gonna leave a, a you know pig tail forever because they leak forever because it looks like the bile wants to go there. And and really uh, this patient, you know, the the five year survival is about 25, 30 percent. You know, you 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 put this uh, a connection between the stomach to the uh, bile collection is actually perfect. And actually, I, I was quite surprised, you know, they actually get better 100%, not even symptoms. You know, they feel like they're back 100% without any drains because everybody hates drains, right? Because it hurts. So they, you do that and they, they, they do get better more than what you what I expected at least. 
Yeah, I, I think kind of going along with what Emily said before, situationally, I think they can be good, but you have to think about, you know, if you're doing that in order to get brushings for a resectable distal cholangiocarcinoma, um, you're, you're changing the patient's operation completely. So, but I, I agree. I think there are situations where they are phenomenal. I think the technologies and the fact that people are, have been able to push the envelope is, uh, amazing and wonderful. And I think it opens up for certain patients, um, a great option, but I think it's just to think about what your operative plan is before you send them down that route. Seems right for a DDW co-panel next year, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Bring it up. <laughs> quick, a quick question from my end also to Matt Tutler and, and all the others who are in that area. Um, what about surveillance of that excluded stomach? We see at the cancer center, not an insignificant number of patients who develop a cancer in that excluded remnant. Um, and obviously doing all these kind of tests when you, you suspect a pathology, that's one thing, but trying to screen for something or, or work up for something, that may be a very different thing. So is there any, any guidance for those patients who had it's hard. I, you know, I mean, I think, first of all, if, if you suspect that there's a higher incidence, you should not do that. Um, so if they have a polyposis syndrome or something like that, certain parts of the world, uh, stomach cancer is a higher incidence. And so in East Asia, it's you know not really recommended to do a ruin wide gastric bypass, or you would consider taking out the, the excluded stomach in that situation. Um, so I think th the best is thinking about it beforehand. Afterwards, you have a hard time. And um, surveillance of that area can be challenging for all the reasons that were that were pointed out uh, eloquently about how you can try to get there and look at it, and it can be challenging. We've had a few people who have had to put in in G tubes um, that they could then dilate up and look at intermittently in order to do this. So it is a problem. We don't see it very well. Thank goodness the incident in our patient population is very low. But if it's not because of their specific genetic characteristics or polyposis, or if they're in a different part of the world. You really should think differently. It does think, push, push the question about getting a family history. You know, I, I, that isn't always before gastric bypass, I think, on people's mind. But you really, if you take a thorough family history too, you can identify some people who should get genetic testing in advance, you know, of a gastric bypass because you, you can miss some CDH1 or, you know, so, something else in a, in a younger person. Sorry to interrupt, um, Dr. But we have a question from our uh, audience here from David. He asks, uh, does the panel think there is a role for case presentation via, via Zoom to discuss complicated cases between community, heart, community surgeons to, uh, I guess, tertiary center surgeons? What, what, uh, what do you think, Andreas? Like, like a Zoom case discussion. I mean, I know I, I saw it at the HPBA group at Facebook, you know, I, I mean, you know, sure, you know, it is a good thing, but it's kind of not formal, right? People just throwing stuff, you know, I do this, I do this, oh, you do this, we, whatever. We actually do, um, um, our um, institution is one main campus, but then there are several community sites that are um, associated with it. And we do uh, do weekly case uh, discussions by uh, teams um, to really try to anticipate the problems before they occur. So the, the better we're prepared, the better you also have the opinions of, of your colleagues, et cetera. Um, I think the lesser is the risk that you really run into a totally unexpected situation. Or if there is a problem, maybe you already anticipated and are ready to take care of it if that happens. I think that Zoom technology is a great, great help in this situation. It breaks down barriers. And what we've done is created in a patient safety organization with our community hospitals who are very isolated. They can't talk about cases with other places because it's protected with their M&M within. We created a community hospital M&M and our patient safety organization. So that discussion is protected from medical legal aspects. But now someone who's on an island in Martha's Vineyard can speak to an island in Nantucket into Western Massachusetts or up in New Hampshire. And they have similar problems and challenges, but they're otherwise literally isolated by islands. Um, um, but now technology and patient safety organizations break that down. So I think it's a, it's a great opportunity and, uh, and one of the silver linings of this, this COVID thing we're going through. So Robert, I have one more question for you. So you have 
whatever, when that period of, of no man's land starts, let's say it's seven days, and you see that the patient comes in, whatever, six, day, a post-op day six has some issues. Obviously, we are not going to jump in right away just because we suspect we have a problem. So we start with some conservative management for whatever it is. But with doing that, we lean more and more into that no man's land. So what is your guidance to, should you just operate earlier or should you then just do that conservative treatment with the thought you're not going to operate no matter what happens unless the patient exsanguinates or, or becomes totally septic? Right. So I think that was probably the difficulty of having that talk because there just isn't a whole lot of data or, or, or just, it's very anecdotal, very uh, sort of old school. This is how we used to do it. And number one, I think the no person's period, you know, it's, it's sort of a, it's a, a misnomer now because it used to be when you do open surgery. Yes, I would agree. That's the time of high inflammation. That's what the time when the, when all the uh, fibroblasts and connective tissue is really solidifying, it'd be very difficult. But with laparoscopy, I, I think that kind of goes away a little bit. So if the procedure was done before laparoscopically, I think that's, you can use that to your advantage. As far as when you go, when you are pending disasters, there's no doubt the earlier you go, the better. And so if it's day seven or day eight, and now you're getting on and on, uh, you've been treated, you know, it, doing an exploration, I think, especially lapar laparoscopically, I think is a good thing. Employing things like endoscopy or IR, if that's, those are the problems early, I think is better. I mean, you get to the point where you've exhausted everything and then you just, you sort of have to go because you can't tell what's going on or you just want to take a look or there's still a, there's still a diagnostic problem. I mean, that, those are the really toughest cases and you just sort of have to bite the bullet and say, okay, we're, we're going to go because something is clearly wrong. We just can't find it with our radiology or endoscopy means. Um, now, I think what happens in the grand scheme of things is that weeds out a bunch of people and so you save, maybe you save 70 or 80% from needing that. And you're, you're, now you're down to 10 to 20% who you have to go because there's nothing else to do. And so in the end, you're, if, obviously to the one patient, they don't care, but to your entire patient population, uh, you've saved a bunch from having to go in right away. Um, it's tough, but I think the one thing that if they're tachycardic, I guess that's the one thing, if they're tachycardic or continue to be tachycardic, you got to go look. You have to look for a missed injury or a leak or something because uh, tachycardia just doesn't go, doesn't just doesn't happen in the post op patient unless there's something wrong in general. Well, uh, thank you for those answers. Thank you for the presentations. I think we already um, used a bit more time than we wanted, but I think it was definitely worth it to do so. Um, I would like to again mention to the audience that may have joined us a little bit later that talks will also be available on the SSAT website um, through podcast uh, system. Um, some of the presenters or all of the presenters may ultimately try to phrase the talks into a small summary report that we can then ultimately uh, submit to jocks. So thank you very much for your um, effort and I wish you good night. Um, I start the evening, others start the night. So thank you very much. Great, thanks thank so much. Thank you everyone, thanks. excellent work.